Well, hi everybody and welcome to another piano video here on the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. We have a special comparison that we're doing today on the channel and I want to give a big uh, thank you and shout out to all the great folks over at Vienna Symphonic Library. They saw the review that we did the last time. Uh, that plugin, like pretty much everything on this channel, uh, you know, we either own or buy with our own money to review. Um, they really dug what we had to say about the CFX. And so they said, hey, you want a demo license for the rest of the stuff so you can check it out. Do whatever you want, do the review, don't do the review. Uh, but we really appreciated some of the things you had to say. Uh, here you go. So I was like, well, I'm definitely gonna take advantage of that. So we downloaded the demo licenses and we've got them loaded up and I'm quite excited now to be able to do a comparison of several of those pianos because they are kind of pricey. Uh, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, these plugins are built and, and really created as premium plugins, probably for studio use or uh, sort of high-end hobbyist use at home. Um, but we've got the Steinway D274, the VC280 Busendorfer, as well as the Yamaha CFX. We're gonna do a three-way comparison between those three great pianos as recorded and I guess rendered through the Synchron uh, piano engine. So thank you so much for joining us for today. If it's the first time that you have found us here on YouTube, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Please hit that subscribe button and the notification bell because it really helps us out at the channel to have people continue to come back, support the channel, comment, you know, uh, you know, enjoy and share what we're doing. Uh, and uh, we'd love to see you back for more videos. So without further ado, let's get started right now with this three-way comparison on the Vienna Symphonic Library Synchron Pianos. There are several things I want to get out of the way uh, kind of up front here. Um, I came across uh, VSL and their Synchron engine as a part of a pretty broad exploration into acoustic piano VSTs or virtual instruments. I guess they're not all technically VSTs, but virtual instruments. Uh, and there were a wide range of really wonderful virtual instruments available for you know various price points. Some under $100, some getting up to and including a $1,000 price point. It's, there, it's a pretty wide array of options that you have out there. Uh, and they all had, or many of them had their place. They kind of had a niche, they had a specific use and a value point. Um, and what drew me to the VSL, or what, what really struck me about um, the VSL uh, was this. I thought that they had done the best job of any of the plugins out there of truly capturing what it was like to be in front of a nine foot piano as a player in a studio situation and to be able to give an equal priority to the playing experience, live real time playing experience as the post production. So both parts of that process uh, I felt had been delivered in uh, just breathtaking accuracy and really just a visceral reaction with the VSL. And the first one I had done was the CFX. Many of these other plugins did a wonderful job of rendering MIDI information as an acoustic piano, but not all of them could say uh, that in a single plugin you could have something that could make you feel the power of a real nine foot piano but then also give the same kind of tools and flexibility that a studio engineer would be looking for when they went to mix uh, a piano. Uh, and so VSL kind of uh, brought all of that to the table with their latest version 
of the Synchron engine. I was really impressed. So that's kind of how we came uh, to know VSL and, and what it was about it uh, that we liked in the first place. Um, the second thing I'll say about these three plugins uh, is that they are not all recorded in the same way. And of course, why would they have created these plugins with the intention of having them be a side-by-side -side comparison. I mean, the point is to basically uh, present all of these instruments in the best possible light they possibly can um, to give uh, the, you know, the, the best chance of each of their character uh, being presented and available and flexible option to a studio engineer or you know, musicians of, of various kinds. So all of these pianos, even though if I had had my way, I would have loved to have these uh, all recorded in exactly the same room, recorded with exactly the same microphones, exactly the same placement, but that does not appear to be the case. They've kind of treated each piano as its own project, uh, selected microphones, microphone placement, and even placement within the room or, the, or what room it was recorded in, um, kind of as its own independent thing. Uh, or at least that's what I've been able to discern based on the plugins, the microphone selection, and some of the uh, literature that they have on their site. Um, the Steinway and the Yamaha have the closest uh, sort of side-by-side -side or apples-to-apples -apples comparison, so that makes it a little easier. But the Busendorfer uh, VC280 doesn't. It's, in a, it's quite obvious that it's been recorded in a much smaller room. There are less surround microphone options, and you kind of, to get a true reverberant sound, you have to deploy the use of a digital reverb engine, either the one included uh, with the Synchron, which Certainly, I'd recommend. I mean, they've they've done a nice job, but you could also have uh, another uh, reverb engine external to the Synchron thing uh, loaded up in your DAW. Uh, so not exactly apples to apples, um, but that brings us to uh, this comparison and what you get. And I made a comment in one of the other videos, uh, basically making the point that uh, when you get to plugins this good, it's really hard to uh, define the point at which you stop reviewing the plugin and you start reviewing the acoustic piano itself. Because when it renders this accurately, ultimately you do wind up basically giving a review of the acoustic piano. Because when the recording is no longer a limitation to the accuracy of how it's rendered, of course, it, it's just a lens to the subject matter and then you wind up focusing on the subject matter. So I'm going to try my best to actually stay focused on the plugin and not get too much into the acoustic pianos themselves, but it's gonna be impossible to avoid uh, getting into uh, both the piano as well as the, the delivery device. So let's just hear all three, and I'm just gonna turn them on. I'm surprised my computer hasn't died having all three of these loaded up at once, but you know, crossed fingers, we get through to the end of this review. And let's just sample the different character uh, now, I've done my best to give uh, as similar settings on all three of these as I possibly can. Um, I have turned uh, the reverb off on all three so that you're just hearing uh, the actual sound of the instrument and not really done too much of a, um, a wide surround sound reverberant room tone on either the Steinway or the Yamaha so that the, the Busendorfer still could you know, stand on its own. Um, I have given a little bit of sympathetic resonance and body uh, resonance because without a little bit of that, uh, you're really not getting a true presentation of how the instrument would be in real life uh, because all of the individual samples can't possibly uh, um, you know, capture the cumulative effect of the whole piano starting to resonate with, with multiple uh, harmonies. So I've got a little bit of that turned on. I know that in the past, you know, there was some mixed reviews of the Resonance engine uh, and what it really did uh, in some of the original versions of the Synchron. Uh, it still doesn't quite behave how I would expect it to uh, in terms of uh, some of the sympathetic resonances, but when you are playing, it's quite clear that there is a larger body um, warmth uh, that gets generated with that, that resonator, both the, the body resonator and the sympathetic. Do it too much and you start to get into some pretty odd effects, but leave it just a little bit on uh, and it does help to simulate um, that, that warmth that you get in real life. So we are going to start uh, first 
uh, with the Steinway, which on the screen is in the bottom left. Uh, and let's just hear what this sounds like. You've got this really beautifully blended tone. Feels like the tops of the notes, whether you're down in the tenor range. Such a uniform uh, envelope to each of the notes. And that's a testament to the instrument. I mean, that's a hallmark of kind of the Hamburg Steinway, but. But it's also how they've recorded it because, you know, you, the wrong mic placement or the wrong microphone, you know, and you can get these specific ranges that just don't speak as well or speak too well. Now I'm using the player setting, so this is a setting that uh, is a fairly close mic with just a little bit of room ambience. But of course, there's all of these quick presets along the bottom. So concert, super like roomy. Far too ambient for most settings, but I don't know, it's kind of fun to play with. You've got intimate, it's gonna be a lot drier. This would be kind of a very similar setting to what you'd see on quite a few jazz recordings using this instrument. The 
little boxed in. Now we already heard player. Uh, pop is gonna be a little more exaggerated. Let that load up. Boy, not sure I'd be using that setting. Just kind of extreme, super compressed, ambient. kind of an arena thing. And there's quite a bit more because you crack that or the folder in the top right corner of this uh, kind of user interface and you get all of the various presets. So you can get surround to stereo down mixes. Uh, you can have the things that are using the Deca tree that's kind of those interesting like two microphones blended with a center stereo microphone uh, setup or just room mix mics which is gonna be a combination of, of several microphones uh, blended together. Uh, so that's what the Steinway sounds like. That's what the Steinway uh, plays like. Um, one thing that I have found with a lot of these uh, Synchron things is I have to go in and really edit the touch curve. That's one thing. Usually on that, in the, whatever, the two by two uh, top right corner there on the grid, I usually just bring that down to about 80 and it makes this behave as I would, you know, want expect. That's the Steinway. Now, let's get the Yamaha loaded up and compare it because those are probably the two that are closest to one another in terms of overall design um, as a part of the Synchron library, but still quite a, quite a different character. I was, I was quite surprised. So we'll turn that on, close this guy down and open up Vienna. So a different tone, I mean, one of the things that Steinway uh, does and managed to capture with their original design, and this has been emulated by a few other instruments, is this almost perfect pyramid of cascading harmonics off the note. So the fundamental, and then you've got your first harmonic and your second harmonic, and it looks like almost like this beautiful just staircase all the way down to the sixth or seventh harmonic. And that's one of the secrets of why it blends so well. On the Yamaha, 
you have a much more prominent fundamental and then there's a big jump down to that first harmonic and then the second and third harmonics are almost the same. So it, it's, a, it's a very different tone. It's like you're mixing the bars, you know, on an organ uh, between your eight foots and your four foots, two foots and your mixtures. And, you know, this is a lot of what gives the difference in character between pianos is what happens with those harmonics. And of course, that's influenced by things like, uh, you know, bridge design, it's influenced by scale design, it's influenced by, in some cases, uh, you know, the rim structure, shaping of the soundboard, all kinds of things. So I don't find it as necessary on the Yamahas on the Steinway to adjust uh, the velocity curve. Uh, I find that it behaves pretty well the way that you would expect it. Um, anytime I can in the synchron, I'm killing the reverb so I can use uh, the natural room reverb because it's so, been so beautifully uh, captured. Um, so you know, you know, I usually start with like a player and then turn just a bit of main on. Here's the Steinway again. We'll do the same thing over here. So that Yamaha is a little bit more upper mid rangey in its kind of presentation. It's a, it's a brighter sound, which of course is not surprising with a, a Yamaha as its character. Steinway is just a bit more colorful. But both of those pianos really wonderfully recorded and both very versatile. You know, I'd almost say that there's no functional difference between either one of those. It's just a personal preference between the character of the piano if you happen to like one versus the other. Uh, but for recording projects, for anything like that, they're both, you know, they play well. So as, as a creative tool, it works well. As a mixing tool, uh, you've got pretty well the same complement of microphones and placements. It's, it's pretty apples to apples. And that brings us to the VC280, which is quite a different beast, even within the same engine. So let's close this down and we'll activate this. And here's the 280. Now this is recorded in a much smaller room. I mentioned that at the beginning.
this is an interesting thing because I heard uh, we were actually speaking to the folks over at Estonia, uh, and they were talking about the fact that on a lot of their more uh, the most recent grants that Estonia's put out, they flattened the soundboard. Now I don't mean they got rid of the crown. What I mean is they they essentially turfed uh, the uh, almost complete widespread adoption of tapered soundboards amongst the top end of the piano builders. And they did this because they found, uh, in their view, that the mid-range sustain, the energy uh, that was released kind of in their, your mid-volumes um, um, at and in your mid-range uh, as well, on a soundboard that was a little bit thicker and, and uniform in its thickness, and in that case, and in Estonia's case, they were also playing around a lot with the rib uh, width and the rib thickness and the rib stiffness, really trying for a different soundboard behavior. Uh, and they made the comment uh, that, you know, well, we were really super impressed um, with the results and we thought we were the only ones on the planet who were doing it. And then they went to a NAMM show and realized that the Busendorfer Vienna Concert Series had essentially adopted the same thing. Don't know whether it was like a stolen idea because this is like old, old, old piano building uh, techniques that are just kind of being dusted off and resurrected with a new 21st century outlook. Um, but it's interesting because as I'm, as I'm playing this Busendorfer Vienna concert, I'm very much reminded of that kind of mid-range bloom that the Estonians have. There's kind of this moment where in the mid-range, in kind of your mezzo forte and mezzo piano range, the sound almost just, just genuinely does bloom and it's a very warm... It's a bit more of a simple sound. Sort of fewer upper, upper partials coming off the soundboard. that this piano or at least this presentation of the piano is just behaves differently and and not exactly what I'm used to as a player is when you get up into the higher volume ranges it doesn't feel like the character of the tone opens up with as much uh, uh, you know fractious beauty Wow I've never used that expression before but anyway sort of maintains that mid-range uh, fullness, but to get any sparkle out of that piano, you sort of have to move up into your upper range. And then there is time that your treble gets a bit glassy. and the, I mean, it's just, it's just like looking out on a perfectly still lake, 5.30 in the morning in the middle of a summer. Just this sea of gorgeous resonance in the middle. Because this is recorded in a smaller room, and maybe that was because of the character of the piano, you do wind up having to use the external reverb engine if you're going to get anything out of it. And I definitely gave the body resonance just a tiny little bit uh, here. I found that um, definitely helped. 
and in the top end to edit that velocity curve down just a little bit to make sure that that treble, which had a tendency to get just a tiny bit glassy, uh, didn't get too out of control, um, which, which I found worked really, really well. So I mean, of these three, because as, as far as I can tell from the various forums, these are the three most popular uh, instruments uh, right now that, that Synchron offers. You've got this Yamaha and the Steinway, which really presents uh, as, as equal but different. Uh, you're going to have a musical preference between the two, but they've both been recorded in the same room. And uh, particularly with the Steinway, it's a very familiar tone. We all know that sound. We've heard it from thousands of recordings uh, you know, over the last hundred years, and they've, they've picked a good one, and they've captured it meticulously. And you really have uh, the same magic of sitting behind those instruments uh, at the point of playing it, as well as having just this enormous palette to work with when you're mixing it into a project afterward. The VC280 is going to take a little bit of getting used to uh, for me. Um, as much as a player, as, as uh, you know, somebody using this sound uh, in a project, you know, finding its little corners and niches, it is a different type of design. Uh, somebody who's totally used to a Steinway, totally used to a Yamaha, or some of the other well-known ones, if you know, if you know the Seebeckstein, if you know the, the Shigeru Kawaii EXs, uh, you know, these are the great, great, um, you know, concert pianos of the day that we're, we're talking about. And the, and the Bösendorfer is behave, it just behaves, at least in this particular uh, capture of it, uh, a little bit differently. Not necessarily for, for better or worse, just uh, something, something to be aware of. It's a different sound, it's a different tone, it's a different, different behavior, different beast. Anyway, I hope that you have enjoyed this three-way comparison um, between uh, the Bösendorfer 280VC uh, CFX as well as the Hamburg uh, Steinway uh, D274. Uh, and I hope you'll be back for more videos on acoustic pianos, digital pianos, music stuff. Obviously, we're getting into the digital stuff here as well, have been for the last several months. Uh, and if you've been entertained and you found this useful at all, please let me know in the comments. And by all means, subscribe and uh, hit that notification bell so you can come back and join us for more videos in the future. My name is Stu Harrison. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again shortly. Thank you.